O Lord Jesus, give us grace to hear your call and hearing to follow with joyful hearts. To the glory of your name. Amen. There are two calls of Jesus in the reading. One is repent and the other is follow. The first, if you like, is quite general. Repent. It's not a word you'd often use these days because you tell somebody they've got to repent, it means you think they've done something wrong and that you mustn't do because if you do, they'll probably sue you. Uh, not for saying they did something wrong, but for not having followed the correct procedures for telling them that they'd done wrong. And nothing ever changes. They put new and more robust systems in place, but nobody ever changes. And I think clergy have their share of responsibility for that problem, because we've downplayed repentance. Almost every sermon you'll hear on it these days starts by explaining that in Greek the word is metanoia, that's the noun, repentance. And it simply means change of mind. And that's quite literally correct. And so you get the feeling that all you need to do is think it over a bit, come to a conclusion that something needs to change, and do it. And that's a gross misunderstanding of human nature. Human beings will do anything rather than admit they are wrong or change their ways. They will obf obf obfuscate, if they can, if they can say it, they will obfuscate. They will make excuses, they will shift the blame. It weren't me, Gov. Sorry, the computer wouldn't let me do anything else or whatever it might be. People will do anything rather than admit they are wrong. And as to changing their habits, we are appalling creatures of habit. We are stuck in ruts. And to get ourselves out of it requires a major effort of will or else major pressure from outside. So we shouldn't undersell repentance. It's a difficult word, but it's an ultimately hopeful word, because it does mean that change is possible. I mean, Barack Obama is supposed to have won election, an election simply by saying, change you can believe in, without saying what it was going to be, which strikes me as a bit of a blank check, but there you are. People bought into it. Change is hope. The chance of repentance is hope. It doesn't always have to be like this. Things can change, people can change, I can change, and for the better. But it doesn't happen easily. And earlier generations of preachers who took the business much more seriously understood that. The Victorian preacher Spurgeon saw four stages in repentance. Quite awe-inspiring words. Illumination, humiliation, detestation, and transformation. But they're all real. Because the first thing, in order to repent, to change, requires an illumination. The lights have to come on. You have to realize that something is not right. I would say humans will avoid that conclusion. We will put up with almost anything, as long as it's familiar and cosy. We will excuse almost any bad habit in ourselves, as long as we've done it long enough. It becomes part of us, that people are supposed to understand and put up with. It requires illumination. It requires a flash of inspiration. It requires, of course... This is what Spurgeon was getting at. An act of grace. It requires God to move us out of our rut. So the first thing is realizing that something is wrong. And thoroughly admitting it. And that's the second thing for which he uses the awesome phrase humiliation. 
not a word you'd use much these days, even less than repent. But the old Puritan preachers from which Spurgeon took his cues used to talk about the gift of tears. We don't talk about that much these days. We would talk about church making you happy and the good news of the gospel. But they took it quite seriously. That before you could move on to the stage of being renewed, you really had to be sorry about what you'd done wrong. So tears for your sins was considered an act of grace from God. I must confess I've only ever done it once in my lifetime, actually cried for my sins. But I did do it once, so there must be some grace in me. I'm, re- re- you know, I'm reminded of the hearing an American evangelist and a Chinese evangelist talking together and they discussed and the Chinese said the difference between what, hap- what we want when we preach is this. When the American preaches, he wants people to fall over on their backs and laugh. When I preach, I want them to fall on their faces and cry. Really, if there's going to be real change, there does have to be a real sorrow for what went wrong. And the reason that you know, the bankers are still taking huge bonuses and so forth is they ain't repented. They may have done a few reforms, but nobody has been really sorry. And that is the problem, one of the big problems for our society. People are not sorry when they have done wrong. The sense of shame has been removed. And if you've done wrong, you should be ashamed. The next thing is detestation. If you're going to really give something up, you really have to come to loathe it. Otherwise, you'll go back to it. Uh, my own only example, really, of successful overcoming, and I've used it so often you're sick of it, but it's giving up smoking, which I did without my much struggle. But occasionally I think, well, I'm old enough now, it won't stunt my growth at this stage in my life. And it takes 20 years to kill you, so that will take me up to above the national average age anyway. Uh, So why not take it up again? You know, I couldn't bear to. I couldn't bear to have pockets full of ash from my pipe again. I couldn't bear to have my breath smelling like that. You can't You've got to begin to distest what went before. Otherwise, there's always the danger of falling back. That's what he once said. It, to be a good gardener, it's not enough to love flowers. You really have to hate weeds. I should be a really good gardener then. But no, I hate weeds, but I also hate gardening. So it doesn't, doesn't work for me. And then finally can come Transformation can come something new and there has to be something new to fill the vacuum Paul says overcome evil with good don't simply not try to do bad but try and do something positively good instead in its place it might sound very dramatic and traumatic But it can be to really change your mind, to really change your character, to really change your habits. But it is good news that it can happen by the grace of God. And the, uh, I say again, the unwillingness in our society of people to take responsibility for their actions, to really put their hand up and say, I done wrong, it was me, Gov prevents real reform, real change in so many areas. Most of all, in the proclaiming of the gospel, which calls people to be renewed in Jesus Christ. That's the point at which Jesus starts. Repent, change your minds, but really leave behind the things that hold you back and join the kingdom of God. 
but to some others, people who I pretty sure were already in the kingdom as far as Jesus was concerned who already had repented and followed him these four disciples we read about who judging by John's gospel and even more authoritatively Helen's notes in the sheet this week must have known Jesus a bit before he kind of just walked up to them for the first time and said follow me like that and they leave everything there must have been some relationship but within that being roughly followers of Jesus. He issues to them a specific call. Follow me. And God issues calls to those who are in his kingdom for specific tasks. Sometimes he calls them precisely because of who they are. Because only they can do the particular job that is needed. Sometimes, to be perfectly honest, he calls us in spite of who we are because he'll make do with what's on offer. Because the job needs doing. And as George Bernus Shaw once said, if a job's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. Better that than it's not done at all. We're in the business of calling someone. This is your chance to be Christ-like. We're going to call someone to be vicar here. Well, actually, God is going to call them, but we're going to actually put the notice in the papers. It is that. We're not recruiting someone for a job. We're calling someone. And it's much more, in fact, if you are a clergy person than just changing jobs because it almost inevitably involves uprooting a whole family not simply changing your work but moving your whole life and that can be quite traumatic you think of it the person you're calling may have to come to Yorkshire from Lancashire that's revolution for you seriously it has to be a call because it involves quite a change in life and that person when she comes like that when she comes will already sometime in his or her life have made the transformation from lay to ordained now that's not an easy shift but God calls people to it because the church needs that certain sort of order, needs some full-time workers, and so forth. Well, the Church of England is chronically short of clergy. I've never said this before in a pulpit, but is there someone here God is calling to be ordained? We've sent one person off, I think, to theological college in my time here. Not a lot for a church of this size and this sort of congregation. Beyond that, there are thousands of Christian charities out there. There are missionary societies, desperate for workers. And you don't have to say, oh, I could never be a great evangelist. The days when missionary societies wanted people to put on solar topies and go out into the bush to preach to people who've never heard the gospel or long since passed. What they're really short of are people with those skills which we have in abundance in the West and they are short of out there. So if you have a good commercial pilot's license, the Missionary Aviation Fellowship wants you. If you're an expert in IT, that's one of the fields that they really do need help, of, help for. If you are a doctor, we know from the support we've given in this church, if you are a vet. But even if you have skills in administration and teaching, there's places for you. And then, just to lower the drama a bit, to where actually the rubber usually hits the road for most people, one of the things we spend an awful lot of time on in staff meetings is saying, hmm, who can do this? 
And the other day at a staff meeting we said, for heaven's sake, we must get outside the usual suspects. Must stop always turning to the same people for the same job. Is God calling you to volunteer for some role in this church? Or simply to step forward and say, is there a role? Is there anything I can do? There's a lovely episode of The Simpsons once when Marge does that in response to the vicar's sermon. And the guy is absolutely flabbergasted. <laughs> it's never happened before. She just volunteers. Well, God calls us, is the message. He calls us to repent. He calls us to follow. To be disciples of Jesus Christ. We began our readings with a reading from the prophet Isaiah. And his call is one of the most outstanding and dramatic in the Bible. But it ends with him simply saying, Here am I. Send me. Maybe God is calling you to say that. Here am I. Send me. It could be a one chance to surprise God. 